Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at State Library of Queensland for tonight's Portrait of an Artist event featuring a Laurie Nilsson retrospective. Please turn your mobile phones to silent for the next hour or so. In line with COVID-19 guidelines, please wear your masks during your visit to State Library, including throughout this event. Please also note there won't be a Q&A session tonight. This event will be photographed and a video recording will be made available on the State Library website in the coming weeks. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander guests and viewers are respectfully advised that the following presentation contains images and voices of deceased people. Now, please welcome Vicky MacDonald, State Librarian and Chief Executive Officer of State Library of Queensland. State Library of Queensland, which is good evening, it's good to see you and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. And it's fantastic to see you here all masked up, <laughs> uh, feels a bit like a masquerade ball but um, thankfully tomorrow it all ends. Um, as Mel has just indicated, um, my name is Vicky McDonald and it is my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland and also to welcome you to State Library for the first Portrait of an Artist for 2021 in honour of the late and immensely talented Laurie Nilsson. The song you are listening to when you arrived is Change Is Going To Come by Brian Owens and it was selected by Pat Hoffey who is one of our speakers this evening in memory of Laurie and I hope you enjoyed it. I would also like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and elders present this evening and I also acknowledge their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd like to welcome this evening Sigrid Nilsson, Laurie's sister, who was instrumental in creating the digital story that you'll be viewing this evening, and pay respect to Lily Ether, Laurie's daughter, and her mother, Belinda Ether. I also welcome Laurie's other sisters, Marianne Nilsson, Carmen Beaton and Helen Farkerson and other family members who are joining us this evening. Thank you to tonight's interviewer and panellists, Michael Aird, Michael Ether and Pat Hoffey. We also extend our sincere gratitude to James C. Suris AM and Marika Suris for their vision and enthusiasm in working with State Library to collect and create artist stories. I'd also like to acknowledge Jackie Huggins, who I saw arrive earlier. Jackie, of course, was a library board member here at State Library of Queensland for many years, and it's fantastic to have you back with us tonight, Jackie. I also acknowledge Courtney Talbot, the Queensland Library Foundation Vice President, and our colleague in the precinct, Chris Hart-Sains, Director of Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. And this event has been immensely popular and uh, originally we were going to have it in auditorium too, but it booked out so quickly that we've opted to have it in the larger auditorium, which I think is much more comfortable in these conditions as well. It's important to celebrate and remember Laurie's talent and his con contribution to contemporary Australian art. Laurie was the eldest of 13 children born to Norwegian father and his man and DG mother, Laurie Nilsson was born in 1953 and grew up living in a tent in the public camping reserve of the banks of Bungle Creek, Roma in southwest Queensland on his mother's country. Laurie was trained in graphic arts and used drawing, painting, sculpture and mixed media as a medium. In 1988, Laurie was one of the first urban Aboriginal artists to have work acquired by the National Gallery of Australia. His works often featured barbed wire and emus, his totem, and his artworks expressed cultural, political and environmental concerns. Laurie held the position of lecturer in contemporary Australian Indigenous art at Griffith University from 1995 until 2006. And most notably, Laurie was co-founder of Fireworks Gallery and a founding member of the Campfire Group of Artists, with one of our speakers tonight, Michael Ether in the early 1990s and the Proper Now Artist Collective in 2004. Laurie was involved in the early days of Radio 98.9 FM and he designed their logo and the bronze door handles at the entrance of the station's main building. 
We are also honoured to have several of his works as part of State Library. Laurie has a special connection to Kirill Dargan on level one. He led a team of virtual art, visual artist students rather, from Griffith University's Queensland College of Art to create the large public artwork which are featured on the external panels of the building, which face the Gallery of Modern Art. The stonework and wood panels depict the unique geographical story of Brisbane. Another of Laurie's creations is a beautifully carved extra long coulomon in the talking circle which is used to catch rain. And his barbed wire sculpture Dolly Birds on a Wire sits out the window of Kirill Dargan. Made from steel and wire, this sculpture depicts the thousands of native animals that die each year on barbed wire fences. We have information about these special artworks at the front of the auditorium, just as um, just on the stool over there. And you can also view them tonight. We're keeping Kirill Dar Dargan and the Talking Circle open until 8 p.m. if you'd like to visit following this evening's event. Sadly, Laurie passed away from cancer on the 6th of March 2020 at the age of 66. And State Library had the privilege of filming Laurie in December 2019 and we'd like to now share with you a small selection of that interview. Can you describe a little bit about how you grew up and where you grew up? Well, I, I lived in a tent till I was 15. The referendum changed that. And, um, but, you know, we didn't want for anything. We, we had um, good food, uh, clean. Um, and I, when I started producing art and talking about the camping ground, a lot of people used to say, well, gee, that must have been hard growing up without hot running water and because everything was heated up in coppers and I was in my element growing up on the creek. I mean, I always say I had seven kilometres of playground. Fishing owls, swimming owls. So that's why we didn't get to school sometimes. And so, Laurie, your journey from the Bungle Creek to be a full-time artist, artist educator, project director, all the things that you do today went through a number of curves just like Bungle Creek did. Now, one yeah, of them, yeah. one of the best bits is when you're a jockey. Now, you left home before the other kids did and headed for Brisbane. Yeah, I come down at 16 and we didn't do those sorts of things back in them days, but, you know, when you're young and you're, you're reckless and you want to do silly things, that's one of the silly things I wanted to do. If I had my time over, I'd do it again. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. Now, Laurie, some parts of your artwork have really become a symbol of yourself. You know, people see any, is it Gorbury, any emu image, and automatically think, Loz. Yeah, it's, there's a few things, I suppose, that have become a bit of a signature, I suppose, the barbed wire and, yep. uh, and the emus. I'm pretty passionate about the old emus because that's our, our totem. Laurie, what drives you to make your art? I, I don't know. I said to Gordon Hooky one day when we were in the studio, it's, uh, you know, when, you, when you're working on a piece and it's working out fine and you've got to down tools and run off and do something and you, you can't wait to get back and pick up where you left yeah. off. And that's, uh, that's when you're in the zone. And um, I just love, um, I, I just love making art. And um, I, I said to Gordon, it's a bit like, um, you know, our ancestors, I suppose. It's, a, it's the act of doing it that's important sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure, yeah. Now, some people, maybe not anybody, maybe just me, thinks that that balance 1990, because it got so many black fellas into the gallery, and because it upturned the idea of doing a cleanly curated show that you know exactly what's going to happen before you get it in the gallery, that was nothing like that. It really turned the tables, yeah. It was, a, it was a absolutely huge show. And it, it, I think I still say it changed the landscape in Queensland, you know. 
I think it, well, I would say, Laurie, that it also potentially changed the landscape internationally because it then became a kind of a, a, t- a litmus test for the Queensland Art Gallery to think maybe we should go international. And very soon after that, we had the first APT, the Asia Pacific Triennial, in, in 1993. Well, I, I, I find. Uh I feel a little bit privileged, actually. I often explain to the students or younger artists that, like, it was um, a train that was leaving the station and I just happened to be there, so I jumped on. (laughs) So um, the old stock must go when the whole team got together and parked a van outside the Queensland Art Gallery during the Asia Pacific Triennial Two, which was in 1996. That was cheeky, wasn't it? That was so cheeky, Laurie. (laughs) So you had this bloody van on the footpath outside when all the other artists who were in there were cramming to get inside the white walls of of the Queensland Art Gallery, you know, big pomp and ceremony. Ceremony. What did you guys do? We just parked at... um Almost at the beginning of the bridge. And what was in the truck? It was um, a, a pretty well little retail shop. It was called All Stock Must Go. And it was about um, how, how um, art's a commodity. And we had artists just sitting around painting and producing artworks and painting up the truck. And, yeah, and did, it was good. Yeah, good no, one. Good. Good one. But, but uh, you know, political art is um, it, it's so necessary. Why? Well, I've, I've seen a couple of times where you can put something up on the wall and you can actually get a little bit of dialogue happening, you know, where sometimes that just doesn't happen for one reason or another. Do you think it's been a, a tool for the proper now group, political art? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I suppose that's been the main, the main driving thing behind uh, proper now is the, the 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 type of art that some of the artists do. Do you think it's made a difference, Laurie? What type, What year did proper now get set up? Ninety six or something. I um. I was a member of it and I didn't know. I was away working. <laughs> and they robbed you in. And uh, Mel and Warry turned up. He said, your name's been bandied around in Brisbane a bit. And I said, what for? I haven't been there to do anything. He said, no, you're, you're part of this what now mob. <laughs> So what a great interview. So thank you, Pat. So I'm sure we'll hear lots more. Thank you. So tonight we honour Laurie's 40-year career in the arts with three special guests in conversation. Michael Aird is a curator, photographer, publisher, researcher and currently director of the University of Queensland Anthropology Museum and an AR research, ARC Research Fellow. Michael is also a member of State Library's Indigenous Advisory Group to the Library Board of Queensland. We also have with us tonight Emeritus Professor Pat Hoffey, AM, who is an internationally renowned artist and accomplished researcher, writer and curator. We thank Pat for interviewing Laurie in late 2019 and welcome her tonight to share her reflections of his remarkable career. And finally, Michael Ether, Director of Fireworks Gallery and a co-founder of Campfire Group. Michael is an artist, writer and curator of Indigenous art. He was a collaborator of Laurie's and a friend of many years. Please join me in welcoming Michael, Pat and Michael. Well, thanks for the introduction, Vicky. And thank you to everybody, all the other staff here at the State Library that have made this happen. And in particular, um, Laurie's family that are here and their contribution to um, well, to, to looking after Laurie, particularly when he was unwell and, and all that support. And, and also Pat for working on this film. And um, so, yes, yeah, I guess there's a lot of people that are all part of the Laurie Nelson story. Um, and I guess I, I remember first meeting Laurie when I first started as a, 
young student at University of Queensland on Friday nights in our little common room. We used to have, um, I think all the students used to organise a few cartons of beer and a few casks of wine and some cheese and crackers and call it a happy hour. And, <laughs> and it wasn't a very fancy, they weren't fancy events, but for some reason Aboriginal people from all over Brisbane would magically appear in this little common room at UQ. And it was one Friday night in 87 where I remember meeting Laurie. And, um, and I guess, yeah, so it's been a, been a long relationship. And, um, and watching him soon after that go down to Melbourne, um, to Gippsland, but start his um, studies and come back with a quali as a qualified, one of the rare Indigenous artists in Australia at the time with, or, or not just artists, but arts workers at the time as well that had university degrees. And um, I also had the good fortune of um, interviewing Laurie um, two days after Christmas. Um, Christmas before last, and um, and it was quite an honour to, to get to really bring some of those stories and hear him talk. And I think one of the things that really struck me was his story about the work he was doing with state education during the 1980s. And and also I did inter interview him back when I was doing, in 2000 or 1990, yeah, 2000 when I was doing the book Brisbane Blacks. And one of the things after he finished his jockey, jockey career was he, he said he was encouraged by two local elders in the community, Eunice and Sam Watson Senior. They encouraged him to do some uh, a train, uh, some diploma, I think it was, some arts, arts, graphic arts course that led to him working at the um, state education, setting himself up in the ed education, Aboriginal education unit at Anala and, and, and running a, apparently a very great publishing business he was running and making money and employing people. So it was great to, to hear that story from him. And so I guess from that, you know, from that, that him becoming a, a commercial artist and manager, publisher, um, he said it was a time when a lot of Aboriginal organisations were for the first time getting together and needing logos. And he was the guy that had the skills to produce logos. And, and as Vicky mentioned, um, for AAA, Murray Country, he was he was there supporting doing doing that work. So, and then of course, then came along late 1990s when Laurie's back in town. Michael Ether had come to town to, 80s. to sorry 80s 89 I meant to say yeah 80 87 88 89 around that time. Um, Michael and Ether had come to Brisbane to start working on the Balance Show in Brisbane, and Pat was around as well 1988. Um, Artists in residence at Queensland Art Gallery. So I might start with sort of, well, tough with to start with, but yeah. we'll start with, with Michael, you were saying that you, um, you know, you, you were selecting artists nationally, and obviously Laurie, as you said, you point out he was one of those few qualified urban yeah. Aboriginal artists. Yeah. Thanks, Michael, and thank you for being here, and I acknowledge everyone who's come along tonight to share, and uh, great stories. Um, I think that slide came up in the film, the two axes, and I'll just sort of drill into that a little bit because that was the first time um, I was working with a team of people, most notably um, Marlene Hall and Marshall Bell um, was also on the curatorial team and we, um, we were a, a roving curatorium and although I'd come to the gallery and I was sort of commissioned to do this show balance, I, I, it was, I didn't really feel comfortable doing it myself and and I I've never felt comfortable doing anything myself really uh, I'm, I'm a, sort of a you know I think collaboration is just something that you have got to run into with open arms and um, anyway uh, it wasn't long before someone sent us a slide we dealt in slides those days 35 mil slides lots of slides and and the story of Laurie Nielsen came and he'd been down at Gippsland, I won't go into too details, he'd come back, he said he'd put on so much weight down there, he had to go back and uh, do some exercise. So he went out ring barking <laughs> for six months with his uncles and, um, well, he looked pretty trim, taut and terrific then. Um, but the axes, and he was making bronze sculptures, he was doing working with timber. Um, so uh, Michael just mentioned... Um, Printing and education, you can get, you can gather from from what we're you know putting together that Laurie was someone that felt very comfortable using his hands on a variety of uh, media, um, 
And his, his ideas about art were, were kind of not invested too much in, in anything more than his experience. He had a wicked sense of humour, as you could see, and he enjoyed that. He enjoyed bringing humour into any conversation um, as a softener um, for other things. And he wasn't, happy, he wasn't you know, afraid of the harder, the harder part. So, yeah, so Laurie came in with that, that work and I remember Marshall and I were really excited to have this, uh, this bronze and this drawing and um, we didn't know any Aboriginal artist who was working in bronze um, at that point. And it was only a year later after we forged a great friendship, um, Laurie ended up moving into my house studio in Spring Hill. And he had the idea of the emu, to make the emu. And we literally made a wax on our kitchen table and we took it out to a foundry with a couple of unknown chaps called um, Matt and Dan Tobin who were running some backyard operation called Urban Art Projects. You might have heard of them. So they have fond memories of casting Laurie's first emu head. Um, so I might leave it at that because yeah. I could, you know, go, go on forever. And it was true, it really was cast from a real emu's head. No, 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 it was nope. made from wax. Oh, from wax, right, On okay. the <laughs> Torrington Street kitchen table. So, so Pat, you, you, you would have met Laurie, you know, when, when he first came to, to, to Queensland Art Gallery. With, and, then, and then there was that transition when he, he goes to Queensland College of Art to start teaching at Seven Hills and you were there. Yeah, he was just one of those people who were around and we all, and there's a lot of people in this audience here I know who would always have a story to tell about Laurie because Laurie was someone with whom you could uh, tell secrets to because he would always trade in the kinds of incidents <laughs> that, that make us all human rather than kind of stand on a pulpit or try to convince you of how good he was. And I was taken in by that, as many of us were. And I'm glad I was, because the way I felt you'd get information from Laurie was on the oblique. You'd be yarning about something or maybe working together because we'd meet up in various places. It might have been cooking on a barbecue or it might have been doing something like we'd often run into each other in the car park of Queensland Art Gallery and we might be just be doing something. And he wouldn't address things directly and you just go around the subject. But later on you find that the information seeps in, that the communication is so strong and that what you've been delivered is not necessarily what you'd expected. Mm. So in a time when I guess the Indigenous, non-Indigenous cultures in Queensland we're not divided by, I guess, what we've got now. Um, although there's a lot of collaboration, thank goodness now. There's a kind of a cancel culture divisionism that is happening at the moment. It wasn't so much, that, sorry, the case back then. So to answer your question about when I met him, I met him wandering. I met him wandering around the car park. I met him wandering around the corridors of the Queensland Art Gallery. I met him in the canteen. I met him over gar b barbecue plates. So it was always informal. And I think that even if you'd put Laurie in a suit in front of a microphone like this, it would still be enormously informal, enormously gracious, and enormously telling. And one of the things I remember Laurie saying about about the, I guess that moment in time of of, of that the, the round the balance opening around that time, he said you know before that we we would just do our artwork and we if we're lucky we'd try and hire a hall and hang some artwork yeah. up and hope that people would come and buy it and mm. do, he said it was pretty sort of small time, mm. he says but all of a sudden round that time we, here we are here he was getting his work hung in the Queensland Art Gallery mm. and soon after purchased by the National Gallery. Mm. He says, but he says one of the big outcomes was we could actually talk to white artists mm. and we could actually talk about collaborating, talk about just what we do. Mm. And obviously you were one of those established artists at the time. Well, yeah, I, I mean, established, oh, no, I never feel established, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm still wondering. But, uh, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, it, when you try to think back on the historical markers of when 
things started happening. Obviously, 1988 was bicentennial year, but things were fermenting in very different ways on the ground level at different places. And I believe that Queensland, and particularly Brisbane, had a take on this that was different to that which was happening in any other part of Australia. And I believe, which is something I was sort of alluding to very obliquely in that interview, that what happened when balance came through the Queensland Art Gallery at that time was so unusual and did prepare for the way in which that gallery was able to deal with others coming through its doors in a way that nowhere had in the world. I mean, Magician, you know, the Magician friend, never went around the right way about inviting people in. There was always that hint of the exotic. But in Brisbane, there was no room for that exotic. And so I will argue that that balance show put down a, 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 a template for the Asia Pacific Triennial to follow. I mean, that's an argument I can't have because Chris Sainz is sitting in the front, <laughs> the front row with a mask on. But can, I just jump, <laughs> can I just jump in there? Um, just so for people who don't know what balance is, because it's a buzzword, the, the, the setup was, uh, it was going to be balance 88, two views, one vision. But then it was actually commissioned by the Queensland Art Gallery to broaden it and workshop this idea and strengthen it and it became Balance 1990, Views, Visions, Influences. So the curatorial setup was um, about the 80s, 10 years, and it had, uh, let's use these terms without being ridiculed, uh, urban black, tribal black and white art. Beautiful. <laughs> lovely divisions. Um, long story short, which is where Laurie's big story comes in, is that the curatorium had a lot of Aboriginal people on it, and this is very important. So for the first time, works that were being selected and even sometimes purchased, not in the same uh, sequence, but selected for the show, went through a curatorium that had a lot of Aboriginal filters on it not just the white filters, being me, um, and maybe one or two others, but it, it went through the processing. So a lot of the works in the Queensland Art Gallery were works that Aboriginal people thought should be in the Queensland Art Gallery. This is really funny when it came to choosing non-Indigenous artists to sit next to. This, that was the hardest squeeze um, so I'm, I'm saying all this because I'm actually trying to paint a picture of how important Laurie Nielsen was in the background of, um, with other artists. And what, it was important, that show was important not because of the objects that were hung on the walls or placed on the floor or the catalogue that's been out of print for 30 years, thank you. Um, can't get them, I don't even have one. Um, it was who, it was, it was the process of the people that came into the building and how, how those personalities and those stories flitted around. That, that was the magic that no one could predict. And, also, and Laurie was a big part of that. And I think Laurie really, you know, he, 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 his artwork fitted perfectly. As Michael was saying before, it was a bronze castings of, of, um, of a European axe and an Aboriginal traditional stone axe together. Such a simple, Ironic. simple work, yeah. And yeah, it and, that, and that also, it, he was yeah. honouring his European ancestry and his, <coughs> and his Aboriginal ancestry in a beautiful, kind of gentle, non-judgmental way, saying, hey, there's just two ways of looking at, the, you know, everything. And, and simplicity is everything. As you could see, and you mentioned, you know, his gratitude um, and graciousness um, and that sort of bush gentleman politeness was how he softened everyone up. If there were some hard, if there were some hard facts that had to come with that message, and often there were. And, you know, uh, he was ready to, to listen and he's also ready to, you know, lay down a few facts. So he was also a rebel as well. He, he didn't follow the rules. And um, I believe he didn't ever pay for parking when at South Brisbane. <laughs> Pat, you know about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that was one of the things that's 
We, b n neither of us did. <laughs> 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 one for a long uh, employment with the Queensland College of Art, as the College of Art became the uni, and it became more of a market-driven force. I guess it was part of a sticking point in each of us that we had to pay for parking. So we always double parked, and he would reverse art so that I could come back in and I'd do the same for him. <laughs> but I don't know that we'd get away with it now. Maybe we'd keep trying, though, that was for sure. Um, and the other rule he didn't really stick to, that the rest of the world learned how to use computers, but Laurie never did. <laughs> no, <laughs> but he found a way around it, that's for sure. Because Laurie was someone who did walk his own walk. Um, walk. And he never had any hesitancy in believing that the origins that he, had, he shared with his people, with his family, were the, was the right way to start the sentence mm. and the right way to end the sentence. So his art drew from that kind of um, experience. Yeah. And he didn't follow the rules of the art world and possibly paid the price for it. And possibly is also still paying the price for it. Um, you talked about the two axes, which of course is if nothing if, it's, if not a conceptual work. Mm. And yet Laurie tr has tended, I think, in the past to be categorised as something that's not conceptual, that's for sure. Mm. You're all the time, the thinking and the practice. But the other thing is, um, and, and Laurie's family will, will know this, uh, other members mightn't, but when you ring barking uh, with his Aboriginal family and uncles, a lot of it was going ahead and scouring around and <coughs> and sifting for, for artefacts and residue of Aboriginal um, cultural material. Um, so the idea of picking up stone axes abandoned in the bush and holding a European axe in the other hand, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was walking the walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other, I guess, jumping forward was you having to, you being you know, in a position to help make this film. What sort of process, what sort of decisions did you make about what to ask or, or how did it...? Look, I was, um, I, I was uneasy uh, in as much as it, be, it, it drops down in the end to a white person interviewing a black man. And, you know, that's the kind of thing we need to get away from in, in terms of, you know, looking at the native informer and the kind of long years of of self-critique where we know that people have the right to speak for themselves. Laurie asked me to speak with him. He invited me. I went back to him again. He said, no, no, let's just do it. So beyond that, there was no planning other than we felt, always felt, I hope, uh, very comfortable in each other's skins. Mm. And from then on, the yarning takes over. And by that, I mean that it's on the day at that moment or in hospital when I sat with him and his family when we would just sit and talk until he was exhausted and then I'd come back another day just thinking about life. And um, things were sure to pop up or the things that you thought you had a hold of, Laurie would come at with a different angle and tell the, the, the tale in a different way and suddenly you saw it freshly again. Mm. But he was... I think maybe it's because I'm older, but he was a rare artist in that when he spoke to you, he also listened to you. Mm. And that becomes a more rare thing too, that he would lean in close and mumble away to pull <laughs> you closer. And he'd look for the reaction. And depending on that reaction, He'd steer the course of the story another way. He'd steer the course of the artwork another way. He had the antenna yeah. for the right time and context and where to shift it that little bit. Mm. And that's got to be a, an approach to art that seeps into life, I think. Mm. Yeah? And Michael, so you, you know, when Laurie was yeah, quite unwell, there was still a commitment from Laurie to produce art. He didn't want to give up. And you work with him right right. Yeah, in the in that when last chapter, um, and that <coughs> came about um, with with the work that is currently on show now at UQ Art Museum. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. Um, it's a series called Dollar Dilemma, and briefly, it's about he he was a bit perplexed about the the notion of um, <coughs> Harold Thomas, who designed the Aboriginal flag and the 
the copyright for its commercial use on clothing <coughs> he, um, had been sold to a company so that Aboriginal, you know, sporting teams or anyone using <coughs> commercial clothing wanted to have an Aboriginal flag sewn in as a, you know, a, a, a sign of support um, had to pay a copyright fee. Um, so the, the conundrum really was that the copyright was owned by an Aboriginal artist, the designer, Harold Thomas, and it was his decision to sell it. But there was sort of a division that it, it, it had, how do you put a price on this when it's been used in goodwill? And he was happy for people to use it in goodwill, but as soon as it became commercial. So long story short, he made a series of um, watercolours and he dragged himself. Sisters, you'll know how hard that was. But he, they were all done on the kitchen <coughs> table in the month before he, you know, in the last, the last, the last weeks. And... Um, and he came in, they, we, we, we had them all up on the wall and um, he, he, wheeled, he, wheeled, he was wheeled into his last show a few weeks before he passed away and um, oh, around 300 other people came to pay their respects. But um, it, he, was, he was still making work um, and I think, you know, I think everyone who, who saw that understood that that was a great energy for him to do, to be able to... Um, to get through the pain of everything that was going through and just leave his mark. And um, he was like that right through. So Pat, like you, spent a lot of time with him, going backwards and forwards, rotating your cars and things. <laughs> um, you, you were well aware how, even though in some ways Laurie wasn't, um, wasn't out there politically active promoting his views, but he was very, very, you know, he had very strong political views, very aware of, of, of politics. And Laurie was a very good teacher, and it's probably <coughs> no more political act than to teach. Mm. Um, and he worked with Jennifer Hurd, who unfortunately can't, couldn't be here tonight. But Jen headed up Bobakawa, the Bachelor of Visual Arts for Indigenous um, artists, the first one of its kind in Australia. Um, he was Jen's right-hand man. And often the young guys who would come into Kaya, you know, would ha find trouble with their stories or fitting in. And because of Laurie's um, skills as a listener, he'd get them working on materials. And that's when the stories come out. And again, as I say, often people would think that he's not teaching but then over the course of the time, the quality of students that that very small ins part of this inst our institution produced was undeniably strong. They've gone on to have stellar careers and are still fighting um, f in all kinds of ways for alternative accounts of Australian history so that all of us, white and black, can attempt some sort of reconciliation about what really happened and what we need to go forward. So he might not have been a preacher of politics, but it oozed through in everything he did through his ethical commitment to all aspects of his practice as an artist, speaking, making art, backing others, teaching, working, connecting family, connecting communities, they all came together as part of his art practice. It wasn't about this, getting in front of a, a, a crowd of people with a spotlight. It was much more important than that. Mm. And he wasn't just a teacher of art, Michael. You've, you've got examples of he, you know, helping young Aboriginal people. That, that he could tell everyone how to catch a fish. Yeah, apart from that, <laughs> we know that. Um, but also about young, yeah, you know, Aboriginal people that have a troubling, have trouble with their identity and coming to terms with their identity. He yes. was so, well, so strong with his identity. I think, yeah, Pat just nailed it, and I think we've seen enough of his laconic, you know, manner. But he was always there, as, as you said, in the background. And when we morphed after the Balance Show, um, we li shared studios, and that morphed into uh, projects and consultants, including the Bobakaya course and. Aboriginal artist conferences, and then Marshall really wanted to get into the political side, um, 
and Laurie and I wanted to do exhibitions and that was the formation of Fireworks Gallery. So Laurie just was there, he lived in the gallery. So right through the 90s he was there but we had a very sort of open door, round table kind of vibe of the gallery because that's how you do it in Roma, I think. <laughs> um, but we, were, we, we didn't want the white cube kind of model mm. of how you interact. We, we showed Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal art and we still do. But that vibe was largely, you know, a lot to do with Laurie. And yes, people came in um, and they would, they would, they'd like the vibe. But if they were troubled and there were people who orientated and, and they just were like bees to a honeypot to Laurie because he exuded that, that uncle feel. And he would listen to them and if they had issues, I mean, a lot of these people weren't involved in the arts industry, they were just people off the street. Um, and sometimes we'd just give them a bit of casual work. Just, you know, as, as Pat said, just to get them involved so they're not sitting around. And um, he would just get them saying, you know, let's work on that. But he, he, he I, I can't tell you how many people, you know, found solace in, um, in listening to him. And they're, they're just, you know, they're great things. And um, uh, they're, they're bigger than a lot of things that get, um, that, hall, that get hallmarked. And, you know, Michael, you were mentioning your early days at University of Queensland. And um, there's a lot of black academics now and a lot of mm. departments and teaching. There's a lot of people qualified to teach, which is terrific. But there weren't many <laughs> yeah. in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, like, people like Laurie just filled blank spaces beautifully. One of the stories I remember him telling me is that he was sitting around the campfire once and there was a, uh, a person at the campfire and she was showing off about how qualified she was. And Laurie said to her, he goes, yeah, I've got a, a BA and a PhD. And she said, wow. Um, what's that in? And she, he says, well, I'm a, I, I know bugger all, I'm an expert post hole digger. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he had that ability of as qualified and as talented and skilled as he was, he never showed off. Yeah. And he, he abhorred pomp. Yeah. And if people were putting themselves up, it wasn't the way to conduct things ethically or to get the conversation going and the exchange going. He'll be very sadly missed in the teaching realm and in the art realm. It's interesting to look at the Propena retrospective, at, well, it's not really a retrospective, but it's currently at UQ. And for some reason, I think that the materiality of Laurie's work shines through very, very clearly. Um, his love of actually working at things slowly uh, and getting his hands dirty um, produces a lot of work which has sustainable conviction. And obviously, you know, he, he was unwell while making the film, but he, you could still, the personality was still there. He just, yep. in the stories, he still can laugh and... Yeah. Yeah. How, how long is the... So we, we, how long is the film? Um, Sorry, seven. The full, no, the full cut, an hour. Yeah, so I've seen a few edits, so I heard, uh, that's available soon for everyone to see. Website, YouTube and video. Okay. So just and it's, I think it's it a, for the audience. And the full, yes, there's a lot more in it. And, and so is there anything else, um, Pat, about the making of it, about, is there things you, that aren't in it that you would have liked to have, Oh. More, is there, I'm sure there's a lot more stories. I'm very grateful <laughs> to the James C. Soros um, support of these films because um, I'm sure those of you in the audience who knew Laurie are just so grateful that we can still hear him talking because the, way, the delivery is as mm. important as, um, and much more important than reading it. Yeah, You get some sense of the fibre of the man. So um, I was... I, I just feel incredibly grateful for that and any, you know, we need as many accounts of that kind as we could get and to the State Library, I'm very grateful that they did, that did this, made this possible and made it possible soon for Jennifer Heard 
and then I think Vernon Aki is going to be covered. So they're wonderful uh, jewels, I think. You know, I many, many years ago, more than I probably should let anyone know, I did some similar interviews on a very ch much cheaper basis. Um, and I beamed them to air, live to air to people in the Australian Flying Arts School so that they could respond. And now when I look back at them, I just can't believe how precious they are because it's like um, a one-hour interview with Gordon Bennett. Holy moly, you know, that just didn't happen after that point. There's another one with Ron Hurley. These people are the fabric of Brisbane art world and our lives and they've affected all of us. And when you see them talk, like I said, I think it's much better than reading a book about them. So as he says in the film, he was, there was a bus leaving and he hopped on it. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and so, Michael, you had a long, you know, personal and business relationship. And um, do you think Laurie would have ever have guessed where the things he, he achieved and then owning a gallery and the... And travelling so many, several trips overseas and... Well, the, tra the travel was really good. Uh, one of the first, I think the first overseas trip, he went with Marshall. We, we organised a, um, a show to Finland. Why not? Helsinki. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to Helsinki. Anyway, uh, uh, we organised a show that went to two museums. It was called Stories. And the first trip, Laurie and Marshall went. Um, and I think that Laurie made a point of going over to Norway while he was there and making his first ever connection with the... Is that right? With the Nielsen? So that, that provided an amazing opportunity. And I think um, I enjoyed several trips with Laurie to Europe in our time and different projects, and it's, it's wonderful when you're... When you've, well, I, I think it's wonderful with, you know, when you've been with someone like Laurie and you sitting down and around the fires of Brisbane and Roma and Man and Greta together and then you're in Europe and you're getting that sense of perspective and I, I think that, that that's what the art world gave Laurie. You know, he was, as you said, Pat, he was very humble about what life was going to give to him but, you know, he always kept his thoughts raised high and he was ready, you know, for that. and and philosophical if nothing came his way. Mm. Um, and he wasn't greedy about wanting everything and wanting everything now. Um, and he would often caution people to just slow down a bit. Yep. You know, and uh, he, he loved travelling, yeah, you know, he lo and he loved buying shoes. <laughs> <coughs> uh, T-shirts, runners, uh, that's about it, and, and, fishing, and fishing gear. Yes. If there was a sale of artwork, I know where it went. <laughs> so, Pat, you knew him a reasonable length of time. You saw him, you know, new, new to the art world, and then towards the end, do you think he changed much in, no. in the time? No. <laughs> Not in terms of the fibre of the man. Yeah. Um, he, I guess, approached it like he would have approached everything in life, that he, he could spot BS at you know, 20 kilometres, <laughs> and he just paid it a wide berth. Mm. I wouldn't say, he was quiet, and his quietness often masked, intol you know, if, if, he, if, he, if he didn't want anything to do with you, he kept it pretty quiet, and mostly, except for one famous night, which was in the backyard, of a campfire. I can hear lots of people in the audience holding their breath. I'm running out of things to tell you unless I go this deep, right? <laughs> <laughs> Laurie the Axe Man lost his temper with someone who'd parked me in. And we all watched through the flames because we could feel Laurie's explosion. Walked right across the gallery, came back with an axe and smashed the windscreen of the guy who <laughs> So he was a man who had a there passion. There was a bit more to it than that. <laughs> but what you noticed was great skill. He, great he skill. Was great skill how to use and an axe. And he moved the car. <laughs> couldn't believe it, this man who'd been so restrained. So that was always there. 
there in the art too. You know, the edginess of the, the trap series, the edginess mm -hmm. of the barbed wire. You know, he was polite and he was unassuming, but there was always some sharp point under there that kept you wondering. Yeah. And I think that's probably good, <coughs> um, you know, to, in terms of what you have, in terms of your, your quiver. What arrow are you going to pull out of that quiver? He had plenty of arrows to pull out. So I think we're running out of time. So any sort of, I think that's a good yeah. <laughs> anything oh. else. Anything else <laughs> needs to be said, do you think? Or? <coughs> I, know, I know that there's yeah. a difficulty with answering questions, but if there's, uh, if there's any topics that can wrap it up with, um, I don't know how we're going to do it's that without so microphone. It's so difficult not being able to ask for the stories from the floor. When we discovered that this was not possible, it was really difficult because the whole fibre of the way he communicated was this interaction, this interchange. Yeah. Do you remember the time when and what did you think? <laughs> did you, were you there? That sort of engagement. He had the capacity to build community mm. and we're prevented because of the masks of carrying it on. But we will when we leave the rooms. Yes, <laughs> yes we certainly wanted to yeah, involve everybody but unfortunately we couldn't. So, so I think thanks again to um, Michael and Pat, and thank you very much to all the library for hosting this. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, Michael and Pat, for sharing your reflections. And I think it's always nice Michael. to listen to friends having a conversation and feeling like you're actually there, part of the conversation. So thank you for sharing your um, reflections. Before we conclude, we'd like to share with you some future opportunities to explore Australian artists. Um, Laurie Nilsson's interview is one of 33 artists' interviews in the James C. Suris AM collection, and it is a collection that continues to grow and celebrate Australian artists. In 2020, we added conversations with Joe Furlonger, Benita Eli, Vivian Binns OAM, and Andrew Anatopoulos. We will also be adding conversations with Jennifer Hurd, Eugene Carticio and William Yang in the coming months. You can view all of these interviews on our website or on State Library's YouTube and Vimeo channels. Also, tonight's session, as we heard earlier, is being recorded and that will be available on our website in the coming weeks. And join us for upcoming Portrait of an Artist events in July. This will be in conversation with Vernon Arkey and in October, Benita Ely will take to the stage and more information on these events will be shared closer to the date. As we mentioned earlier at the beginning, currently in Kural Dargan on level one is our showcase Deadly Threads, which explores the emergence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island designed clothing in Queensland and its importance in social activism, cultural rituals and on the port sporting field. Included in the showcase are designs by acclaimed artist, artists Vernon Arkey, Richard Bell and Sharon Finnesay. Kural Dargan, as I mentioned earlier, is open until 8pm and you can book a curator's tour on our website. Also, Laurie's artworks and those of fellow Proper Now artists are currently on display at the University of Queensland Art Museum in the current Affair exhibition which we heard about earlier as well. And finally, another free event presented by State Library is the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Game Changers event. And on the 29th of April, we welcome contemporary artist and entrepreneur CJ Hendry. Not only has CJ Hendry flipped the art world for formula on its head, she's changed our perception of how creatives operate as entrepreneurs in business and enterprise. And CJ will be on stage with Emeritus Professor Serby, uh, Susie Derbyshire. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and it's been fantastic to have you here at, at State Library tonight. Uh, we're really thrilled to have people back in our auditoriums and uh, as from tomorrow, it'll be a much more comfortable experience as well. And so we do look forward to welcoming you back to f our future James C. Suris AM uh, interviews. And of course, remember to watch them on our website and also our other events as well. So thank you, thank you for coming tonight and thank you again to our panel. It's been fantastic to have you here. And as I mentioned, there is a brochure at the, B, at the front of the auditorium here which details the works that we have of Laurie uh, in Kirill Dargan, which will be open until 8 p.m. tonight if you'd like to have a look at those or any time when the State Library is open. So once again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.